I um, work at Bank University and I'm a researcher there. Um, so here I am, the photo of Conway Marina, and these are um, my oysters in the oyster nursery here. So I'll be t today talking a bit more about the work we're doing, how we're going about restoring native oysters and why they're so important. Here is a illustration. Um, so drawing from uh, Billingsgate uh, fish market down in London in 1835. So you can see that it's a hive of activity. So it's oyster day. So it's a big day celebrating the first oysters landed. Um, every year and um, yeah you can see there's a lot of merchants on the streets sort of selling their oysters you can see children are trying to sell oysters to these passerbys and then um, children also uh, made these shell grottos you can see in the bottom right there um, as sort of like displays and they would you know people would give them a few pennies uh, for their efforts and um, so yeah it was a great hustle and bustle and um, there was a great demand for oysters as well, and they were an important part of um, food and also for, um, were very valuable as well to poorer communities as well. So they weren't as, um, they weren't being only in the, like they are now sort of with champagne and uh, seen as quite an, an expensive um, food source. So these were sort of a, um, a more sort of commonly eating food. Uh, so back in London in the 1800s, the population was less than 2 million, but um, every year more than 200 million oysters were eaten every year. So that's sort of an average of everyone eating more than 100 oysters a year. So yeah, there were uh, big feasts and uh, mayoral dinners where they would eat lots of oysters. And then also on the street, you could easily just pick up some oysters whilst you were walking down the street. Um, so actually you could buy four oysters for one pence back um, in those days. So yeah, they were very important and we've been eating them since um, Roman times. So globally there are 30 different species of oysters. Um, so here in the UK in the top right, um, this is a photo from Whitstable where they actually had to celebrate Oyster Day. And here you can see the um, the oyster king and queen here, and they have a huge parade. Um, and then also here in Mozambique, um, oysters are um, collect collected on the shores by women and then sold in markets. And it's um, sort of like a, a social activity as well. And um, also in some species of oyster produce pearls, as some of you might know, which um, goes into producing jewelry. And in France, oysters are seen as quite a delicacy. Um, so yeah, oysters are a really important um, food source, but also um, as um, a form of income and also as part of the local culture as well. So here is an uh, oyster. So you may not have um, seen an oyster like this before um, under the water, filter feed in a way. Um, you may have seen them look more like this when they're out of the water, but um, oysters are known just like a snail, um, but they're known as bivalves uh, because they've got two shells that um, are connected at a hinge. So um, these are our European flat oysters, our native oyster. So oysters um, sort of uh, congregate together and actually form uh, reefs um, just they're our UK equivalent to a coral reef. So just like uh, coral reefs, they've got lots of, they provide lots of habitats for lots of other plants and animals, as you can see in this image at the top. Um, and they are classed as an ecosystem engineer because they form all those different habitats. So here we are, here's some um, other images of our uh, European native oyster. So that is our native species in the UK. Um, and so these really beautiful photos because, um, yeah, usually when you see oysters, they're sitting there on the plate. Um, but yeah, you actually see them under the water here, sort of filter feeding. Um, and they are really, really beautiful animals. And so you may have spotted as well, this seahorse here, <laughs> um, just near the um, oysters. So, in the UK, there are actually two species of oysters. So like I was saying, we've got our native oyster, which is the 
European flat oyster and uh, how you would identify these on the shore is they have a rounded sort of rough shell and they are a yellowy green colour and they grow to about 15 centimetres um, in length or known as shell height um, and they're usually found in shallow subtidal sort of coastal estuarine habitat and um, usually like to um, the oyster larvae as you can see in the image in the bottom left like to settle on either other oysters or oyster shell or other shelly material but we also have um, uh, a invasive species known as the pacific oyster um, so these have a more elongated shell so they've got that sort of tear tear shape uh, teardrop shape and um, some of you may have seen these maybe if you've gone to restaurants um, these are more commonly sold and uh, found in restaurants and um, they're quite sharp they've got like curved edges and they're a pinky purpley colour and these are found on the intertidal shore so a bit higher up the shore than the natives and um, usually in coastal areas again and muddy estuaries and they form these like dense reefs also um, and they're faster growing than our natives so um, they can sort of in areas on the south coast they actually have problems where they're sort of uh, just in the hot weather and if there's a hot summer then you get this peak in spawning and then you get quite dense patches of reef forming and it can sort of outcompete and block out um, space for local species to inhabit and so it can be quite problematic so there are sort of measures in place to try and control um, Pacific oysters. Um, so here we are, some images next to one another, so you can see the difference between the native and the Pacific here. Here we are, so as some of you mentioned in the poll, um, oysters are known for filter feeding. Uh, so here is a video, time lapse video, and the tank on the left just has algae in, no oysters, and the tank on the right did have algae in, um, but has oysters in there, and you can see them sort of filter feed in a way, and just over a few hours, that water is now nice and clean. So I'll try and uh, play that video again for you. Um, so a single adult oyster is able to filter 240 litres of water uh, every day. So you can imagine how great they are at uh, filter feeding when you have a whole reef of oysters. And um, so they're able to extract any impurities or excessive nutrients or um, sediment in the water and really improve the water clarity and the water quality, which is just beneficial to many of the water users and um, the animals living within the water as well. So they're really great. So. Uh, so why oysters? So why resort oysters? Why bother? Um, so uh, around the world, uh, we've actually lost 85% of our oyster reefs. So here you can see um, reef condition. Um, so you've got blue, which is good. So very few areas are classed as good and good condition. And then you've got areas here in yellow, which are fair. Uh, but around Europe, so where we've got our native European flat oyster, um, the condition of the reefs is poor or functionally extinct. So functionally extinct means that you have a few individual oysters. However, they are so far apart, they just can't reproduce successfully and just can't restore their numbers. So that's why we need to intervene. So actually around the UK, we've lost 95% of our oyster reefs. Um, uh, which is awful and um, oy oyster reef is actually classed as one of the most uh, vulnerable uh, marine habitats in Europe. So here on the piscatorial uh, atlas from 1883 you can see these orange areas uh, which were um, where there were oyster reefs back in 1883. Um, so you can see a big area of orange um, there just um, sort of just east of Dogger Bank um, and then also pretty much all around the British Isles we had um, oyster reefs and um, our oyster reefs actually uh, were the equivalent to the size of, of Wales they covered that area that was so quite vast and um, so you can see we had oyster reefs in Codgan Bay but we also had them in areas around Anglesey so like Ross Collin 
uh, Cladwin Island, um, in the Menai Strait as well, and also down here in Milford Davon, um, and in um, and in Swansea as well. Um, however, presently there are only small pockets of oysters left, so we've got some um, up in um, up in Loch Ryan, up in the west coast, some in the west coast of as Scotland as well, the Firth Clyde, um, down in the River Fowl, some in the Solent as well. Um, however, yeah, we've lost 95% of our native oyster population. So we're on the fight to get them back from the brink of extinction. So when you restore native oysters, you actually um, also restore the ecosystem services that they provide. So like I was mentioned before, they increase water clarity and water quality. And by forming those reefs, they also increase biodiversity by providing those habitats for other plants and animals to take shelter and also provide food. Um, and by bringing in more animals, um, you can start restoring sort of providing that food source for commercial fish species so that helps with fish production surrounding uh, fisheries and um, also you've got the oysters themselves um, um, and um, that cultural value as well because like the previous illustration the drawing of um, Oyster Day and all those celebrations um, you know they are an important part for coastal communities and yeah it's quite important to restore them. They're also great at um, extracting excess uh, nutrients so when you've got um, sort of runoff from farms when there's heavy rain um, or, um, or from just surrounding land um, they're able to extract those uh, excess of nutrients so to improve the water quality and also yeah they just stabilize the sediments um as well so um yeah the time is now so we have just entered the un um decade on ecosystem restoration so what um this means is they're aiming to i have written it down um just to make sure i get it correct and um, they aim to prevent halt and reverse degradation of ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean so yeah very a very large task but um yeah there's a lot of different projects all happening across the world and um, where they are trying to restore different ecosystems and uh, that have been lost among those is uh oysters as well so if any of you are on twitter you follow the hashtag gen um, generation restoration as well so how can you restore oyster habitat so there are three main barriers to um, recovery of oysters. So we have a low number of mature reproducing oysters actually in our waters. We have a lack of suitable habitat to grow them on, which is known as culch. And you've also got this lost living memory that like a lot of people don't realize how important oysters were or that you know in their local areas, they actually used to have oysters. Um, and yeah, just how important um, they were um, so it's quite important to bring back that sort of and um, through the wild oysters project we're sort of aiming to reignite that sort of local passion for this wonderful species <laughs> um and there are a lot of uh, different stakeholders who will also benefit from native oyster restoration so you've got the coastal communities um by just you know, it's sort of being um engaged through education or outreach activities and getting involved in projects you've got the local economy because of course you've got oysters and um, it's a good source of tourism and also improves water quality and uh, recreational fishes and um, because it, it will also increase you know sort of the number of crabs in the area fish species all the different animals that um are commercially important um, and also nature lovers you know just like a coral reef it'll be brilliant to dive and snorkel and see all the different animals interacting with the oyster reefs um as well so the wild oysters project so the wild oysters project is funded by the people's postcode lottery um as part of the postcode dream trust and um we began we got that funding in um june 2020 so right in the middle of <laughs> covid so we've had quite a few delays in our first year um but we have got our oysters in the water and great push from all the partners and all the team to do so and uh, we have oysters in all of our three sites across the uk so i'll be discussing a bit more about our activities and what we've been up to 
Um, so our, the Wild Oysters project is a partnership between the Zoological Society of London, so ZSL, which are um, an, a charity based down in London Zoo, and they do a lot of education, citizen science and research. Uh, also Blue Marine Foundation, which is a charity which um, lobbies a lot for sustainable fisheries and um, works a lot with government to, for policy, legal um, and media and also carries out a lot of conservation work across the world. And also we have um, British Marine as a partner as well. So British Marine are, um, uh, own quite a lot of uh, marinas and boatyards and then um, across the UK and have a lot of uh, members. Um, so they're brilliant because they really um, helped us gain access to um, marinas. And um, yeah, just so, sort of, because I feel like um, sometimes with uh, ocean um, conservation and um, boat users um, can get um, a lot of stick <laughs> because um, sometimes they can be the cause of pollution but here with British Marine they're really sort of engaging with us and um, have really pushed for this project to go ahead to really sort of um, uh, improve um, yeah, just improve and make space for nature within the marinas and it's really great to see that sort of partnership. Um, so as I was saying, the Wild Oysters Project have got three, um, three restoration hubs. So we've got one up on the west coast of Scotland in the Firth Clyde, um, that's in Logs and, uh, and uh, Fairley Marina. And then um, we also have um, in England, we have our restoration hub in Tyne and Weir, so in the northeast coast, and that is in Sunderland and um, Sunderland and oh goodness, it just left my left my brain. Sunderland Marina and the Port of Blythe. There we go. And um, also in Wales, like I was saying, we're based in Conway Bay, and we um, have our oysters in Conway Marina and Gamway Marina. Um, so across the UK, we have 126 oyster nurseries in the water, um, and we hope that over the three years of the project, they'll produce more than nine billion larvae, so the oyster babies, um, which will be released into UK seas. Uh, we're going to have three seabed restoration sites and, and sort of near the marinas where hopefully those larvae will settle and form those sort of wild oyster reefs. Um, and um, as part of my role, um, I engage with local communities and also school groups. And throughout the project, we hope to be engaged with 50,000 people including 12,000 school children and um, 150 citizen scientists will hopefully be enrolled through sort of training and um, yeah, working with the project as well. So we have three parts to the project. So we have the oyster nurseries themselves um, and then which we've done. So that was phase one, so they're in the water. And we're sort of moving into year two now and phase two, which is seabed restoration. So actually um, restore, when you um, fish for oysters, you don't just remove the adult oysters, you also remove that really important shelly substrate um, that the oyster larvae need to settle on. So sort of restoring the seabed so that it is a suitable habitat for the larvae to settle. And then also um, engaging through outreach and education activities with local communities as well. Here we are, here's a video taken uh, down in the Solent. So the Solent, in the Solent, there's the Solent Oyster Restoration Project, um, which have, uh, which sort of trialed using the oyster nursery. So they've been doing this since 2017. And um, here are their oyster nurseries. So you can see all the different tunicates and sponges all encrusting onto the cages here. And um, yeah, you can see it's different um, fish species that interact with the nurseries themselves, use them as shelter and also um, possibly food as well. Um, and the oysters are sort of held in these, um, in these oyster nurseries. So you get, when we go down to the marina, you do get quite big shoals of fish sort of swimming around. So those are some striped sea bass. But yeah, you also get mullet. Um, swimming about the nurseries as well. Yeah, it's brilliant seeing them all. 
below the water. So these are just suspended below the pontoons in the marina. So a lot of the time, marina users don't know that they're there <laughs> until I go down and I open them up. They go, oh, wow, that is brilliant. They're just using that space and they're suspended up off the seafloor. So they're sort of protected from predators like crabs or starfish that might try and get in and um, eat the oysters. So yeah, they're sort of five star hotels for the oysters. <laughs> um, so why Conway? Um, so Conway actually um, has a long history of shellfish production and um, they had the old MAF, which is now CFAS uh, Marine Station there in Conway, where there was a lot of um, research carried out, especially um, during the 19, well, it was throughout the 1900s, uh, when a lot of fisheries were going into decline as well as the native oyster fishery, and they did a lot of research into um, non-native species that they could try and introduce to um, sort of keep the market afloat, so one of those being Pacific oyster as well. Um, but also in the Menno Strait and around Puffin Island and Anglesey, there were very productive uh, oyster beds in the 17th, 18th and 19th um, centuries. Um, so here you can see an image of an oyster smack, which is the traditional oyster boat, a uh, sailing boat that they use to fish off. So they drop a dredge off the back and then just powered by sail, just dredge up the uh, oysters. So these are actually the traditional boats still used down in Fowl on the south coast. And then here is a map. And so if I put a little oyster on all these different areas where there used to be oysters, so you got them on the Clin as well. Um, all these, uh, and then also in South Wales and in uh, West Wales as well. Yeah. So we did have um, quite productive oyster reefs around Wales. Um, very important um, for the local economy and for coastal communities as well. But a lot of that is forgotten because of um, it's known as generational amnesia. Um, so if you have a generation that you know doesn't have oysters or doesn't have that knowledge, and then they won't pass that on then to the next generation, and then it's just sort of lost from um, local memory. Um, so actually, on the Great Orm itself, they actually found. Um, oyster shells, native oyster shells, dating back to the Neolithic and Bronze Age, so that's 12,000 years ago. So they have been in the area and they have been eaten by others for many, 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 many years. Um, and here are some of the researchers from uh, that the fisheries station in Conway, so going out in the Menai Strait here. Um, so they've got a sort of lined up uh, slate um, tiles with uh, oyster spat on so they'll go out and put those in either spatting ponds or out on the shore to try and um, get the, get oysters to um, grow successfully on them. So as I was saying we're partnering with British Marine and uh, so we have our oysters stored in those oyster nurseries in the marina so here at the top right you can actually see an image where the hatches have been opened so you literally just lift up a bit of the pontoon got a metal bar across there and that's where we hang the oyster nurseries so in um De Gamway and Conway Marina we've got um 24 nurseries in both and each nursery holds 27 oysters so between both marinas we've got 1300 oysters or thereabouts <laughs> um and so here's an image on the left here of myself and the project manager celine from zsl uh, scrubbing our oysters so these were when they were delivered back in march um so we got them delivered from loch ryan um which is one of the few remaining uh oyster um, well places where you can get oysters in the UK um, so we got them delivered from there and we're scrubbing them with wire brushes to scrub off any um, hitchhikers so you get sometimes sponges or um, animals sort of sort of hidden in in the hinge of the oyster so we're giving them a good, a good scrub as a biosecurity measure to make sure that we don't introduce any sort of um, uh, any sort of species that aren't currently present in Conway and um, yeah we put, put them all in our oyster nurseries here and you can see the bottom bottom right there is butterfish <laughs> doesn't look very happy for being disturbed <laughs> um, and it was greatly received we had um, a really great um, regional and national press release which was picked up by um, BBC and um, we were on Channel 5 News as well um, but yeah, which was brilliant because we didn't expect it. And um, yeah, it was great. 
um, to see that sort of real interest from uh, people to know what we were doing, why we were doing it, you know, what, what, why we, what we were oysters about. And um, yeah, it was brilliant to see. Um, so this is a video um, from one of our monitoring days. So as I mentioned, through my role is to engage with uh, local communities and through that I carry I recruit volunteers on a monthly basis to monitor the nurseries and the health of the oysters and the to monitor biodiversity all those different animals that are interacting with the nurseries so this was um, a video taken by Andy from Skylands Media who's just a local chap who um, offered to collect some drone footage of just a day of what we do down on the monitoring um, down during the monitoring event. So here we are, Conway, and we were in Conway Marina that day. So we um, get the nurseries out, count the oysters, check for any uh, mortalities. Um, and then we also carry out a biodiversity survey. So we use the net there at the, on the right hand side, and we put any animals that we see into the trays. We use ID guides to ID the animals that have been interacting with the nurseries and then once we've counted them they get returned back to the water as well so here's one the oyster shell so you can see even though we scrubbed them all in march you've got all those encrusting um communities developing again yeah it's pretty pretty beautiful day <laughs> we're sometimes very lucky with the weather when we have our monitoring days So I've got a great team of volunteers, but always um, recruiting more and always keen to engage with as many people as possible. So if that's something that you're interested in getting involved with, then I'll have some details of how to contact me later in the presentation. So um, these are some of the different species that we've found um, in oyster nurseries. So like I was saying, we've got oyster nurseries as well as the wild oysters restoration hubs. There's also them down in the Solent and they actually found them um, last summer, I think, um, a spiny seahorse, which was very exciting. And we ourselves have found um, this um, summer. So even though the oysters have only been in the water since March, we've actually um, found since June, every month, every month, um, we found uh, European eels, which are critically endangered. Um, so they've actually, since the um, 1970s, they've lost, I think, 90% of their population as well. So that's really brilliant to see how the native oysters, which are you know, endangered, sort of helping another endangered species as well. And um, so we found those in the nurseries and we return quite quickly because you shouldn't, um, shouldn't handle them because um, they are so, so um so sensitive and handling um, and we found either adults so earlier months we were finding adults that are probably making their way up, up the river to spawn but now um, when we did our monitoring last well this month earlier this month we actually found we found some more smaller sort of juveniles which are a bit lighter in colour and um, which have possibly been coming down coming down the river um, so yeah overall uh, so, so if we found 97 species in the nurseries across the UK, so it is brilliant. And here's a video from uh, the Scottish site of Firth Clyde. This was just taken earlier this week. So David, the local project officer, actually shared this with me. I thought it was brilliant. Well, show you all here. So this is just GoPro. This is not a snorkeler. Um, this GoPro in the water here. You can see the nurseries and just all those fish. It's unbelievable. And I think. So um, Scotland had some delays getting their oysters in the water. Um, so theirs actually went in in June. So in just a short space of time, you've got all these um, all these um, shoals of fish using them. The shelter and you can see the feeding away there as well, like on all the encrusting communities as well on the uh, on the cage itself. And um, yeah, it's brilliant. So I think this species um, is quite difficult in the video, but these could be sort of juvenile pollock. Um, but yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? All those fish, unbelievable. Yeah. So in Conway, we've, um, like I was saying, we found an array of 
different species so we get a lot of uh, prawns a lot of shrimp and a lot of mycid shrimp it's quite interesting earlier months um got so many amphipods hundreds of amphipods and then of course then you've got then the other animals coming in that feed on the amphipods and you know just seeing that sort of progression in the different animals that we see um yeah plenty your fish <laughs> as well as well as our eels um, so yeah, this is some of the activities as well that I've been doing. So I've been carrying out um, school um, events as well, school sessions. So uh, London Zoo um, through the ZSL have developed an education programme for the Wild Oysters Project, which is um, um, is a sort of free resource that we're hoping to be able to share through events that I run, but also it can be downloaded by teachers from wherever from our website. Um, and then they can use those resources and include them in their sort of classroom sessions as well. And they're targeted for key stage two and key stage three. So from the ages of eight to 14 as well. And so what we carry out is a pre-site visit. So I go into schools or when it was COVID, did it online and just did, um, uh, just sort of taught the children a bit more about oysters um, and taught them some exciting facts about them as well and played some games so that they get that sort of baseline knowledge before they actually come for the marina visit so we call it an oyster safari so they get to come down to the marina and um, see the oysters for themselves you know, collect data so measure the oysters and um, sort of be assigned this sort of be assigned marine biologists for the day and um yeah able to draw them all the and they also see all the um all the animals as well that have been interacting with the nurseries as well and just learn a bit more about their local marine environment because even though for schools in conway who have the sea on the doorstep you know a lot of the children possibly haven't really explored the marine life down there or know what's in the water so it was really great to put it in that aspect and and then um, learn about food webs and food chains um uh, using the animals that are in it, what they find in their local waters as well so as i mentioned so phase two of the project is to restore the seabed um, so currently with bang university we've been uh, modeling um, to use some hydrodynamic models to predict where the oyster larvae, so the oyster babies, will go. Um, using, um, so it predicts using tides, winds and currents um, based on those movements of where after seven to ten days, which is when the oyster larvae have sort of used up that energy source and will sink to so they're quite passive in the water for seven to ten days and then once they've used up their energy they'll then sink to the seabed and develop a foot which they then tap about on the seafloor looking for suitable substrate to settle on so you can see that second um image there that's under a microscope and you can see all those all those oyster larvae there sort of developing um and so we've developed these models and we sort of have a couple of sites in mind that we're sort of discussing with of course nrw and um, because of course we don't want to be dumping a load of shell on any sensitive habitats because that would be awful um, and we will um, once we've sort of decided on a suitable site we'll then carry out some baseline surveys because you never know ground might be really good already and there may not be any need to introduce or put shell down um, and we'll sort of carry out surveys to see what sort of sediment what sort of animals are already there in the um, in the benthic communities um, and then here is an image of culture deployment for the Onori project. So that is um, in Essex. So that's the Essex Native Oyster Restoration Initiative, um, which is another ZSL project um, where they've actually put lots of culture down um, and they've seen really good settlement as well of native oysters on these sites. Um, so as I was saying, cultures, this sort of shelly mix. So we're looking to use um, sort of oyster shell, and mussel shell scallops as well have been um, quite successful too. And then here, hopefully we'll develop these oyster reefs. Um, so how can you get involved? So you can share your oyster facts. Um, so if you use social media, you can use the hashtag wild oysters. You can find us on there as well. We've got our, um, our Twitter at wild underscore oysters. And we're also on Instagram as well. 
Um, but if that's not if that's not your cup of tea, you can just share your Easter facts with your friends, your neighbours, your family, um, and you can also uh, join us. You can um, follow us on our website. You can um, keep up to date with our pro progress and our activities, what we're going on. You can also get involved with volunteering. So, like I mentioned, to carry out um, monthly uh, monitoring sessions where I recruit um, key volunteers to help out and um, yeah, get hands on with the oysters themselves. And um, yeah, you can also help us with our citizen science. Um, so you can get involved. We have uh, Oyster Watch on our Wild Oysters website where we um, upload more of those underwater videos and you're able to watch and sort of report what, what different species you can identify and how many of those. So to help us sort of um, understand what different animals are interacting with our oysters. Um, so yeah, if you would like to get in touch, um, our website is wild-oysters.org and uh, you can also reach us on our email so wild.oysters at zsl.org as well and um, so yeah feel free to send send her over over an email and say that you're interested in getting involved in Conway Bay um, so make sure that the email comes to me <laughs> um, otherwise you could have a long drive up to the Firth Clyde um, so um, yeah, I'll now open the floor to any questions, but yeah, thank you very much.